Candace Roper is my friend. She's a teacher. She's a doula. She is a podcaster. She's a writer. She's a mother, a sister, a daughter, all the things that we love about birth. Candace is a certified doula with Jona. She is a certified hypnobirthing, uh, hypnobabies, excuse me, instructor. Yeah. And she's going to be um, starting those classes up in 2021. She is working towards her um, board certification lactation consultant, IBCLC. And that is a big deal. So she has generously been a friend of Hive and um, comes almost weekly to our newbie mamas and, and supports um, breastfeeding. She has a lot of experience over, you know, 12 years, probably 15 years by now, um, supporting births. And her oldest is 16. She has four children. Her youngest is four. So she is really in it. And she is so gracious. She has a podcast and a magazine with her sister that I hope she'll touch on. We're going to have her sister, um, Jessica, come on um, and talk to us. But uh, Natural Mother Podcast and Natural Mother Network, because it's more than a podcast and a magazine. So with all that said, if you have any questions, um, Jen and Peyton, this can be your private audience, but um, I'm really excited to hear what uh, Candace has to say. And thank you so much for being here. It just means so much. And always being here. I mean, Candace, you have, it, I have texted you on a weekend with a mama who's struggling and you respond, you show up and you are just so gracious. So thank you so much. Um, Candace, take it away. I'm so happy to be here. I feel like um, I'm the one who's being allowed to be here, not you were like, thank you for helping us. I'm like, you're helping me. So, okay. Um, so talking about postpartum, you know, I've done this so much and I'm excited to just touch on a whole bunch of things. And then I'll have so much that I'll mention that I'll, I'll email you. We've talked about this, a list of resources so she can send these out to everyone. Um, so you don't have to worry about writing down what I'm talking about because it's just going to be a lot. So um, I tried to narrow it down and it's hard to do, but to 10 like important points of postpartum. So the first one everyone wants to know about, I'm going to start there, is sleeping because, you know, even at, at a birth, I was at a birth just two days ago and the nurse said, you might want to take a nap now because you won't sleep again for 18 years. So it's a common common concern, I guess, right? Um, so some things that I think are really important is to find out what's normal for a baby and sleep because, well, every baby's going to be different too, and that's a thing. Um, I have a mama I'm working with now that her first baby was a great sleeper, like slept six hour stretches at night from the beginning. And now she has her second baby, not doing that. Um, but that's normal. So it's um, good to know what to expect and what the range can be. Because if you get one that sleeps really great, and then you get a second baby who's more needy, it can throw you for a loop for sure. Um, and some of the things that I notice when I work with mamas is knowing the difference between light sleep and deep sleep for a baby. And light sleep, they move around, they do funny things like flutter their eyes open and roll their eyes back and make noises and squeak and squirm and they're still sleeping, but it's light sleep. And then that last 20 to 30 minutes, it's usually when they first fall asleep, it's 20 to 30 minutes of that, like squirmy sleep. And then they get into a deeper sleep that lasts for more like an hour or an hour and a half. But you'll often hear moms who are saying, my baby doesn't sleep more than 20 minutes ever. And that's when the light sleep stage ends and the deep sleep stage starts and the transition between the two. So if every time that happens, if the baby cries, which they might, but they'll probably have their eyes closed. And the best thing to do is to soothe them without picking them up and making a big ordeal of it because then they'll learn to go from light sleep to deep sleep on their own. And that's kind of your goal because then they'll get to these one and a half, two hour naps that they can do alone. And, and that's a really big hurdle for a lot of people. Um, and then how, is the, how are the parents gonna get any sleep is the next um, important point. And it's kind of, one good way to think about it is if you need six hours or eight hours normally to function, like you find your happy number, 
go to bed when the baby goes to bed, which they're on and off all day. So that's hard to pick. But so say your baby goes to bed at eight, but they'll also eat and go back at 10 or 11. You can pick whichever. But if your goal is to get eight hours, it's gonna be in smaller pieces. And one good rule of thumb is to just stay in your pajamas until you get that number. So if you go to bed at 10 and you're gonna be up feeding a whole bunch throughout the night, that happens. But until you get your eight hours, stay in your pajamas. So you might be in your pajamas till noon some days, sometimes 10 a.m., sometimes all day, let's get real. But at 10 a.m. when you're like, okay, I've hit my number, get up and get dressed as a self-care thing to do. You're probably not going anywhere. But even whatever that means to you, you know, you can still wear yoga pants, but you know, it's just a thing to like get up and make it day and, and make the day go on. Um, what else about sleep? So another thing to think about is mom and dad bo both don't need to be awake all night. So one of the two should get some good sleep at any given time. So one of the really best um, tips for postpartum depression, and we'll get to that later, is to take shifts. So if dad can stay, like mom goes to bed at nine until two, doesn't get woken up. Not in the first couple weeks when you're establishing breastfeeding, but after that. Um, if dad can do a bottle or help baby to stay asleep till two, and then mom switches and mom is up on and off from two to seven, and dad sleeps from two to seven. So you take some shifts so each person gets a good solid hunk of sleep. Each night is ideal, every other night is even good. Um, as far as prevention of depression, four straight hours is um, <clears throat> at least once a night, minimum for mom. Um, but even if, it, even if you can't get it every day, if you can get four hours or four to six every other day for mom, that really prevents uh, a lot of disorders. So that's helpful. Let me think what else. Um, there's a lot of good books about it that also help you get um, an idea of what's normal and like when to expect what. I see a lot of that being the issue is that a mama might expect to sleep through the night at a certain age or, and, and your baby might, you know, but what's average is not that, <laughs> not a baby sleeping all night long real soon. So having a realistic idea of how sleep develops in a newborn um, is helpful. And one thing, one of the main points I remember is it's around four months that they even start to have a pattern that is predictable. And the pattern starts with the wake up time in the morning, the first time that they're like, hi, mommy, I'm awake. And it's like every day it's about seven or every day it's about six or whatever time, but your baby will regulate themselves. And if you know what to watch for, it's good to be able to work with that to get the best sleep. So um, other things are, the recommendation is babies are sleeping in, in the room with mom for six months and safe sleep, like don't put extra blankets, don't put products that are not approved for sleep, but also there's something called the safe sleep seven. I'll put that in my resources too. That is about how babies can safely sleep with the mom and only if mom gets better sleep that way. Otherwise, that's not your solution. So whatever gets everyone the best sleep is the right answer for your family, but knowing what's safe and what the recommendations are and that it, it isn't the most horrible thing in the world to sleep with your baby, um, it can be done safely. And so there's a regulation for that, like recommendations, you know? So I'll throw that in there too. And then another resource I really like is called takingcareofbabies.com. It's like, Kara is a girl's name, taking, C-A-R-A, babies. Um, she has sleep programs. So if you want someone to tell you exactly what to do on day one when you're really losing it and need some sleep, you know, and it's very um, evidence-based, very developmentally appropriate. She's really good, really knows her stuff. I think she was a nurse and her husband's a pediatrician and she wrote all these sleep programs and they're really, really good. So, and I've seen them used and seen them work really, really well. So they, she has like online classes basically. Um, that's basically it for sleeping, I think. Uh, let's go to the second one. So for me, I'm trying to put these in like a priority sort of order. The second one that I find with people having concerns with a lot is breastfeeding. Um, if you're bottle feeding a baby and doing formula, I would just ask around, ask your pediatrician, ask your friends that you know that have done that and get the best bottles or the formula that you can stick with. It's not good to switch formulas often, but um, 
yeah, so start there. But as far as breastfeeding, we'll go through just a couple really quick. I mean, you could spend five hours on that. Um, so just a few things. One thing I hear often is women saying you, you have to feed the baby eight times in 24 hours. So every three hours, and that's not how a baby's body works. They don't go, I eat at nine and 12 and three and six and nine and 12. It's not predictable like that. And eight times in 24 hours is the absolute minimum. Instead of it being the goal you're shooting for and the maximum you're shooting for, it actually is the absolute minimum. So 10 is better, 12 is better. Um, other things that I don't know that people that I see that people don't often know is your milk supply is set up in the first two weeks and a lot of it is set up in the first 24 hours. So the amount of times that you attempt to breastfeed in the first 24 hours sets up your milk supply for 12 months. A lot of people don't know that and they just don't, the, the baby's sleeping because they're tired or, and, and babies that are a slight bit premature, even just two, three weeks or babies that have jaundice or babies that are just really tired from the birth. You know, there's a lot of times when it's hard to figure out how to nurse a baby. And so the first few days they're not feeding very often and they don't know what to do, but that's the critical time. And, and what's cool about it is that attempting to breastfeed counts. So if the baby's just trying to latch on, but they're not really latching on well, and they're not eating really well, but they're kind of playing around with it and um, just learning how to do it, that all counts at, as setting up your milk supply. So that's really, really cool. Um, it's important to learn about what a good latch looks like, and there's plenty of videos on that, even YouTube. Um, I have a favorite, I can link that in my resources. Um, let's see, the other notes I have on that is, supply and demand so kind of like economy but it's a little bit backwards so with breastfeeding it's demand and supply is how i always like to teach it the amount that the baby removes the baby or the pump the amount of actual ounces that come out of you is how much milk your body will make so it's okay to pump if you're in pain or have way too much milk at the beginning but if you keep doing that your body will continue to make more milk than your baby needs which is not a horrible problem to have because often it's the reverse and you're not making enough and then that's a different problem and it's harder to fix than the other one. So that's one thing. Um, when milk first comes in, it can be really painful and people get engorged. My favorite hack for that, well, there's two things you have to know. Engorgement is sometimes too much milk, but more often it's just inflammation. So it's not necessarily going to be fixed by removing milk. So it, when that's the case, it's swelling. So it's um, ice packs are really helpful and ibuprofen can even help. Um, ice packs though, you get the little, um, see I have to use my hands, disposable circle shaped nursing pads that are for leaking milk. Get a whole bunch of those, put them on a cookie sheet, drizzle them with water and put them in the freezer. And then when they're all frozen, stack them up and put them in a baggie and then they're just in the freezer ready to go. When baby is done with a nursing session, you can put on the ice and it helps with the engorgement, but doesn't affect the milk supply. Um, you don't want to use ice before the baby nurses, but after is fine. And um, so that's a good one. One more note on this. One more note on breastfeeding. Well, there's a couple. Um, crying is a late hunger cue. So that's another really good one for mamas to know is when a baby's hungry, first thing that you'll notice is they wake up. Second thing is they wiggle. Another thing they do is put their hands to their mouth. Another thing they do is like smack their lips or do their tongue or open their mouth. Um, they'll also, you'll notice like if dad or even grandma or anybody is holding the baby, the baby will turn their head and try to suck on someone's shoulder or someone's arm or whatever. All of those are signs the baby's hungry. Crying because they're hungry is a late hunger cue. So it's not wait till the baby cries and then feed them. It's really hard when you're learning to breastfeed to feed a really mad baby. That's tricky. So if you can catch all these other cues before that happens, um, breastfeeding is easier to learn. So that is good. It's normal for nipples to be sensitive and or to hurt in the first 30 seconds of a feeding. And if they hurt the whole feeding or after you're done feeding, that's not normal. And then the other most important thing is to know where to get help and some of it's free, so that's really good to know, is La Leche League, um, Breastfeeding USA, and that's where you can find me on there, and I also help people for free. And then IBCLCs, if you're having like a real clinical issue or a bigger problem that you need, um, that's the expert in breastfeeding. So you can find one by asking around, ask your pediatrician, your midwife, your doctor, the hospital where you gave birth, or birth center, 
um, they can all refer you to someone. So that's who you would have. Some of them make house calls, some of them are on Zoom now, some of them have offices, you know, whatever. There's not anyone in Park City, maybe at the hospital, no? There is somebody there. So that's breastfeeding. It's gonna be hard to not talk too long. <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. Okay, so the third one is everyone else has to eat. Everyone else in the family has to eat. So make that easy on yourself. And when people are planning for postpartum, a lot of people are thinking just a couple of weeks that they'll need help. Stretch that out and make it at least six weeks. And then really in, in the adjustment in your life, it's more like a year. So, but having real serious help, six weeks, like that's what you need. So have your friends or someone who like throws you a baby shower, have them set up a meal train for you. It's a free service online where your friends can sign up, friends and family can sign up to deliver you food. Um, you don't wanna be up and cooking and don't think that you can be. I had a postpartum client one time, I actually met them at the hospital and drove, you know, followed them in their car home with their baby for the very first time. Um, and she, it was great. She gave me good recipes to make. I learned a lot of cool foods. They were a different culture than I was. And I learned all these great recipes and they had me roast a whole chicken. And after we were done with that, get the meat off the chicken. And the husband was like, she wants to save the bones to make broth. And I was like, not this week. She's not making chicken broth this week. No way. And I threw him away. But mama thought that she was going to be up making recipes for lunch and dinner every day day one. She actually thought she was going to do that. So don't do that. Um, you can make freezer meals when you're cooking in the last parts of your pregnancy, make a double batch of whatever it is you're making and freeze it. That's another good way. Um, other favorites are like HelloFresh or those meal kits and they have really good introductory offers. They always do. That just takes out some of the planning and some of the thought of what are we going to have and do we have the ingredients and that it just shows up on your doorstep does still take some cooking time. So daddy can, the, in, the instructions are easy. Daddy can totally do it. And, or grandma or whoever's coming to help you out. Another thing these days that's really cool, especially with COVID, grocery delivery and Uber Eats and getting takeout is another way to make that easy for you. Um, but the first couple of weeks, you should find a way to make this not a thing that you have to think about, you know, as the postpartum woman. So, there's that. Everyone's got to eat. And then when people say, hey, how can I help you? Or do you need anything from the store? You never, ever, ever say no, ever. I will get to this again in a minute, but never say no. They can bring you a veggie tray. They can bring you a watermelon that if you have other kids, you know, you can always use a pack of strawberries, whatever, but always think of something because ready to eat snacks like a veggie tray or like anything you would see at a party, like finger foods, um, are the best thing for breastfeeding because you're going to need a lot of extra calories. So there's that. Um, okay, we're on to number four. Should I just keep going there, Sarah? <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. Um, four, I'm talking about recovery, like recovery from birth and knowing what's normal and what's helpful um, is really important because really often it's like, okay, I went to the bathroom and there's a blood clot and I don't know if that's okay. Do I need to call? Do I need to go in? What, you know, like what's happening? Um, important things to know of what's not normal. Having a fever is not normal. Any foul smell is not normal. There's some, sorry, no TMI here. Some level of smell <laughs> postpartum. There's a little bit of smell, okay? But it's not foul. It's not horrible, right? But it does have a, a little odor. Okay, and then pain. Like having pain in your tummy, having new pain after you've gone home and then now all of a sudden you have new pain that's not normal um a little bit of swelling in the feet or legs can and hands and stuff can be normal but if it's extensive or a lot also not normal um other important points is bleeding should just get less and less and less over time it should be the highest flow that it is right after birth and it should lessen and lessen and lessen over time if it doesn't say it was lessening for two weeks and then you get up and vacuum and clean your house and you're doing all the things and then that day you're bleeding more. It's very common and that happens, but it's because you did too much. So it does take a long time for that. It's a plate size opening on the inside of your uterus that is bleeding. It takes a long time for that to heal. That's why you can bleed for six weeks or more. Um, 
yeah, I don't like to call it a wound. People always call it a wound. It's a plate size wound. It's not a, it's not like an injury. It's a thing that happens and you're bleeding from this thing where the placenta used to be and it comes off and now you have this. Yeah. Okay, so that should lessen over time. My other favorite hack, remember the breast pads with the ice on the cookie sheet? Same thing with maxi pads, okay? So you get a whole bunch of maxi pads, line them up on a cookie sheet. You can do just plain water, you can do witch hazel, you can buy special tea that you can make for this for recovery of the perineum, whether you have stitches or not. This can be really, really helpful. If you don't have any stitches, you might not need it. But it, if you have any, and most people have some, uh, line those up on a cookie sheet, make yourself a whole little stack of ice packs for your bum and you use them and they're fabulous. Um, and then the only other thing I have on this is the old wives tale and the old rule is, and please go ahead and follow it, is one week in the bed, one week near the bed, one week in the house. So that's three weeks before you go anywhere, you know. And another bonus of COVID times is that not a lot of people are going to visit. So that's kind of cool because the less entertaining you have to do and the less people in and out, that's exhausting. Whether you're laying down or sitting down the whole time or not, you know, it's actually really tiring. Um, when I had my third baby, my daughter, my mother-in-law came to town. They didn't stay at our house. They stayed at a hotel. That's also very key. Make sure that happens. Then, th but they'd stay all day, the whole day. So they were at my house for 12 straight hours. That can be exhausting. I was going to put this in a different point, but I'm going to throw it in now. Make yourself with your partner a secret code word. Um, sometimes it's pineapple. I've heard of all sorts of funny ones that don't mean anything to anybody else. But this is the word that everyone needs to leave. So when mama starts feeling overwhelmed or baby needs to eat or she's just like, I don't even want this neighbor here, like the people that just show up, just have a word that you can be like, hey, honey, do we have any more pineapple? You know, and so he gets to be the guy who kicks everyone out of the house, not you. You don't have to do it and you're not going to want to do it. And you're really emotional. Mamas, it's normal to get emotional and to cry and stuff like that. So you don't necessarily want to be the bad guy in that scenario. So seriously, a secret code word. That means get everyone out of here. I need a minute. Um, so useful. I so wish I had that and I didn't have it. So, okay, that's number four. And number five is ties in, but it's the pelvic floor. So it's really important to know that your pelvic floor is gonna take a little hit, right? Okay, so baby's gonna come out, but what's normal? People say, if you laugh or sneeze or jump on a trampoline, you pee a little after you've had a baby. It's like, that's common, it happens to people, but it isn't normal. And it isn't the new health, the new level of health that now I pee every time I go on a trampoline. Um, it could be that way for the first little bit while you're recovering and that's okay, but it should go away and it shouldn't stay that way forever. You also shouldn't feel like anything is falling out. You shouldn't feel like when you stand up, your bottom is going to fall off. It's just the things that people don't know. You know, You're, if you have stitches, they should heal well and normal. Later on down the road, painful sex is not normal. All of these things are not normal and there's help for that. And there's pelvic floor physical therapy for that. So get help if something is not normal. It's not normal for years later to accidentally pee a little when you're on the way to the bathroom. It's like there's things, you know, that can be done for all of that. And really, if I had my magic wand, whew, pelvic floor PT would be included for every single woman everywhere. And it should be. Um, and do some kegels. After you're feeling okay, <laughs> after things don't hurt too much, kegels I found were the most important and most helpful thing. And a lot of people say that. So if you've had a lot of stitches or something and you're trying to get things back to normal, one more random piece of advice, and if you didn't get it yet, there's no TMI when you're talking to a doula, okay? Um, don't look, don't look at it. <laughs> That's my other piece of advice. If you've just given birth and you've got stitches or you've got whatever and you're curious and you wanna see what it looks like, just don't do it, not yet, just wait. <laughs> That's my advice, don't check it out. It, it can be kind of traumatizing to see and it all comes back to normal very, very well. All those tissues that you are made of are made to give birth and have babies and they do go back to normal. Um, but you don't need to see that. 
I just, the client I just helped have a baby two days ago asked me that. She's like, should I look? I was like, no, please don't, don't look yet. Give it a, give it a month, maybe at least, maybe more. And, and I wouldn't get out a mirror and check it out. Okay. Or at least I wouldn't recommend it. You can ignore me. That's fine too. Okay. That was five. We're on to six and I'm cheating because this is a tip for postpartum, but I'm starting before that. So for six, I have go back to the birth. So if you're already postpartum, there's some things I'm going to talk about, but also if you haven't had a baby yet, don't discount how important the birth is to your postpartum. And that's what I want to talk about. So having education and having a good experience, and I'm not talking about having a natural birth or getting everything on your birth plan as a good experience. I'm just talking about it's positive and empowering. That's what really, really matters in your postpartum. Having a traumatic birth makes a huge difference in postpartum. Um, so what I have on this is education. Get, learning a lot about birth helps you to have a more positive experience. The other thing I have on here is doulas for birth. Um, if you have a doula, the statistic is you're 34% less likely to have a negative birth experience. So it's huge. It's a big, big deal. And, and coming from someone who's had really crazy hard births without support and really crazy hard births with support, very different. Um, there are a couple of books called, there's one called How to Heal a Bad Birth. Really important if you've already given birth and you're feeling like, it was more of a tornado and less like the beautiful experience you were hoping for. How to Heal a Bad Birth. And there's another, birth co uh, another book called Birth Trauma. It's like a guide book and it's a longer sentence there, but it's called Birth Trauma. And then it's also important to know there's counseling available for this. So if like my first baby, I couldn't talk about the birth for maybe even a year or more without crying, that's not normal. Um, Find someone who you can talk it out with, but also know that there is help for this. There is counseling for this. Um, and you can get PTSD from a birth. And even being a doula and watching a really hard birth, you can get PTSD there too. So there's a lot of help for this and it is important to process it so that you can move forward. And if you don't, it can greatly increase your chances for postpartum depression and all that stuff. So the birth is super important for the postpartum, which is kind of why I do what I do. I started out doing births and now I do more postpartum and less births, but, but also it all just ties together. The reason I think birth is so important is because the postpartum is so important. Um, okay, so there's that. How are we doing on time? Okay, um, what I have for number seven is ask for help, and, but also receive help. And that can be really hard for people. So when people ask you, which they will, you've just had a baby and someone will say, lots of people will say, how can I help? What can I get you? Do you need anything from the store? Like I said before, try not to say nothing. Try not to say ever, I don't need anything. We're doing great. Actually, that's one of the most concerning things. If I go to a, a home of a postpartum woman and everything's done and the house is immaculately clean and everything's perfect and she doesn't need anything, that's actually scarier than going to someone's messy house. Totally scarier because it's a sign, also a sign of like postpartum anxiety disorders. If everything's perfect and she looks perfect and she's got her hair done and she's got her makeup done and everything's great, it's like actually not really ideal. So, um, so what I say is think of something like a veggie tray. Anybody can bring you that. Um, and also say, I can't think of anything now, but I'll put your name on my list. And when I do need something, I may call you. So later when you're running out of wipes and you know, the next day and you need something, then you know who to call. Um, but always use those people. They want to help. That's why they're offering. They want to help. So give them the opportunity to help you. But also when you need help, ask for help. It can be really hard. I remember with my first baby, I would want to sit down and eat dinner and other people would sit down and eat dinner and I would never get to eat my dinner when it was hot. Babies have what I like to call hot food radar. <laughs> so you're about to sit and eat and your meal's hot and every single time the baby will cry. It just happens. And so I always tell the daddies when I teach childbirth classes, I said, you eat your food cold, you microwave your plate, you do not let your woman microwave her plate. She just gave birth. You let her sit 
and you hold the baby and you let her eat and you microwave your plate because really it, it's not that awesome, you know, <laughs> to sit there and watch everyone eat while you soothe your baby. You might want to, but eventually it, it also helps you burn out, you know? So let's see. So if you're in that case and you're the woman, you say, excuse me, can you hold the baby while I eat? You know, learn to ask for what you need. And it actually can be hard, especially if you're not someone who normally does that, or you have a hard time normally doing that. Postpartum, it just gets more, you know, this gets a little harder. Um, but now when, if you're pregnant or if you're going to have another baby, you can make a list also of all the things that you do on a daily, like a normal basis, not daily, but you grocery shop, you walk the dogs, you, you know, run errands, you clean, you do the laundry, you change the linens on the beds, you do, you vacuum, you do the bathrooms every Thursday, whatever. You make a list of all this stuff and farm it out as much as you can. And you can hire someone to walk the dogs. You can hire a housekeeper for even just once every two weeks for the first two months postpartum. And you should, you know? And if that's not in your budget, find your neighborhood teenagers who need something to do and need a little bit of money. You can probably pay them $10 to walk your dogs. You don't have to hire the fancy dogs that are down the road, you know? But really think about it. Like, who can you get? And all your family and people that want to help, these are the lists. You're like, hey, actually, you could run to the store for me. I'll give you a list. I'll give you my card. You know, that's what you can do. Um, which leads me to number eight. Number eight is postpartum doulas. And that's what we do. Um, it's, and I will say, being a postpartum doula, it's way cheaper to hire a housekeeper. And it's way cheaper to hire a neighborhood kid to babysit, play with your toddler, walk your dog. Still cheaper. So do those things. That's cool. But postpartum doulas... Some of us work days, some of us work nights, some do a combo. I've done everything from grocery shop, run errands, cook recipes. That's actually really fun. Um, take care of baby, teach mom to take care of baby. And then at night, our goal is almost always just to get the mom as much sleep as possible. And sometimes on a night job, we'll fold laundry and we'll do a few other things. But for the most part, it's just focused on getting the mom sleep which is great. When mom is bottle feeding, it's easy. And we just make bottles, feed baby. Mom sleeps all night. Lovely. Fantastic. When mom is breastfeeding, it's still great. You go and wake her up when you really, really need to. But all the little squeaks and squirms that we talked about with baby, mom doesn't have to wake up for those because you have the baby. She's in a different room. So when baby's really awake and really hungry, we go in and get mom, wake her up. She feeds the baby. That's it. We walk out. She lays back down. And then we soothe the baby, change the baby, burp the baby, get baby back to sleep. Four hours later, we'll see you again and wake you up to breastfeed if you want to. Sometimes we do a mix of bottles and breasts. But anyway, it um, is really worth their weight in gold. I've never really heard anyone say they wish they didn't hire a postpartum doula. You know, it took me four babies to be smart enough to hire one for myself. And it was fantastic. And... Another, just going back, I've never heard anyone say they rested too long at postpartum. When I was saying a week in the bed, a week near the bed, and a week in your house, I've never heard anyone say, I wish I didn't do that. I've heard a lot of people say, I didn't do that, and I should have. Same with a doula, same with asking for help too much, you know, no one ever says that. So those are all things that are good to think about. Let's see. Okay, number nine is postpartum mood disorders. And how common this is, is really kind of crazy. And this is just the ones they know about. So there's that too. It's one in seven moms and one in 10 dads. So something also to know is that dads can get postpartum depression. It's a thing. So one in seven moms. And this is just what we know of. How many more that aren't being reported or aren't being diagnosed or aren't asking for help is higher. It's definitely higher. Um, so knowing about the signs of that is really important. Knowing about baby blues. So baby blues is like the normal hormonal adjustment to motherhood. And often that's um, most obvious on day four. So as a doula, as a person who does birth doula, day four is always a really important day. We always check in with our mamas on day four. Day four is like the hormonal crash from being pregnant to no longer being pregnant. And also when, usually when the milk comes in, and it can be a highly emotional day. Very normal for a mom to cry on and off that whole day, maybe the next day too. 
um, but for a little bit. Baby blues mean it's hard to be a mom and I wasn't expecting I'd be this tired and I cry at Hallmark commercials. You probably did that when you were pregnant too, but that can last for a couple of weeks, a few weeks, and then it should get better. And if that doesn't get better, that's when it becomes a problem. Um, and can be more serious, can be postpartum depression. And it's really important to know what, um, what that looks like. And it's really important for partners to know or family to know um, what the signs are of that. And one of the major, major ones to look for is just you don't feel like yourself anymore. Your personality is not the same anymore. You're not laughing, you're not smiling, your personality is not the same anymore. That's a really big one. Another really big warning sign is when the baby's asleep, you can't sleep your mind is racing and you can't fall asleep. So you're like, I know I only have two hours till the baby wakes up again and you just struggle and you cannot sleep. That's another huge, huge sign. That's actually a more scary one on the list. Um, what else? I will link you in the resources that I'm gonna give you to the, um, there's like a quiz that you take that helps to diagnose postpartum depression. Um, another really important thing to know is there's other disorders, not just depression. So postpartum anxiety is a whole nother thing. I had a mama I worked with that she knew she had anxiety before. She was so anxious during pregnancy. I know she would let me share this story and I'm not telling you who she is, so it's okay. But during pregnancy, she accidentally ate a bay leaf. So had made soup and there was a bay leaf in it and she ate it on accident and looked it up that bay leaves are toxic to babies. So she made herself throw up her dinner because she was so scared something was gonna happen to the baby. She just had so much anxiety, like every little tiny thing, you know? Um, but what happened postpartum was she washed her hands so much that her hands were bloody, 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 really, really, really sad. So postpartum anxiety is worrying about every little thing. Someone who can't sleep because they have to watch the baby breathe. That's one. Um, that's really, really common. Um, and then also postpartum OCD, which is like, you know, checking 30 times that the baby's a monitor is working and checking, you know, that the front door is locked 30 more times and, and constantly being worried. And another sign of postpartum OCD is intrusive thoughts. So it's not a thought that you enjoy having, but it's a thought that happens. Like, what if someone comes and steals my baby? Or what if I drop the baby? Or what if I'm going down the stairs and we fall? And you think it every time you're walking down the stairs that's a postpartum OCD thing. So none of those things are normal, um, but all can be treated. They're all treatable and recoverable. Um, and there's also postpartum psychosis, which I think is what people think of when they think of postpartum mood disorders, which is like absolutely lost touch with reality, hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, um, full blown, no longer in touch with reality. That is a thing and it is really, really rare compared to this one in seven, totally not the same. Um, and it requires absolute straight to the ER, 100% go get treatment, just like that. Um, but that's a very, very scary thing, but very rare. But postpartum depression is so, so common. Okay, so some resources, there's something called the Utah Maternal Mental Health Collaborative. That's cool, because it's a local resource that can connect you with providers that have training um, and counselors and all that. Healing Group is a great um, counseling center. I saw Joanna had this ready. And I have one in my car that I was bringing in for this reason, so it's kind of fun. Um, and they have an office in Park City and they have support groups, counselors, all that stuff. Um, postpartum.net is like the postpartum international support group. What else do I have here? The EPDS, it's like Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale. That's the quiz that I'm gonna send you. Um, and there's a resource down in Salt Lake that's called Felicity Women Center. It's a, a, a postpartum nurse that became a therapist. And so she's on top of it with all this stuff. And then before we move on from postpartum, I'm gonna read you these little questions that come from the healing group. And it's just a good way to check in on yourself. And if you're a partner of a postpartum woman, it's important for you to see these too, because I always tell the dads, when I teach classes, I give them this for sure. And I tell the dads to check this every day too, for themselves, but also, hey, has my wife done this, you know, or my girlfriend done this? So it says, have I eaten enough nutritious food today? Having no appetite is a big sign of postpartum depression. Mama should be really hungry. So when you're pregnant, you need 300 extra calories per baby. If you're doing twins, it's 600. Um, when you're breastfeeding, it's 500 extra calories. So mama should be very, very hungry. 
And if she's not and has no appetite, that's also a big sign. Um, have I slept at least five hours or taken a nap? Have I bathed or showered today? That's another big one. We shouldn't be calling a shower for mom self-care. This is basic, basic human care. Mama needs a shower, okay? Um, and mamas take a shower. If you can't put your baby down and you're alone and dad's at work, you know, there's ways to do this. I always put a bouncy chair in the bathroom right next to the shower so I could peek out and look at baby right, you know, every 10 seconds or whatever I had to do. But get baby in there with you if that's what you have to do. But get yourself, it doesn't even have to be every day. Let's get real there too. It's not, you don't have to shower every day. But whatever made you feel human before you had a baby, you know, going to your yoga class, talking with your girlfriend, having coffee with your friend, whatever it is. And you can do these things on Zoom now. You know, so you don't have to go somewhere. You don't have to leave the baby, but you do need to have some non-baby time. There is a question on here that says, have I had at least 10 minutes of quiet time for reflection and renewal today? And I think you could also say, have I had at least 10 minutes of kid free time today? Kid free time. So when daddy gets home or whenever, you know, whenever you can, even if it's when baby's napping, but just go outside and get some sunshine, get some fresh air, do something that is not related to caring for baby. When baby's asleep, don't always be doing baby's laundry and washing bottles. Don't always be doing baby related things, talking on the phone about the baby. You've got to do some things that are just you before you became a mom. That's really important. Okay. It says, have I exercised at least 10 minutes today? Have I let myself laugh today? Have I let others help me today? Have I kissed my baby and told him or her I love you today? Have I talked to at least one adult today about how I'm doing and not just the baby? And that's another thing for us and everyone else. When you're checking in on someone who just had a baby, try not to only talk about the baby, you know? And try not to come over to visit your friend who just had a baby. Give her a quick hug or maybe not at all and walk straight to the baby, you know? It's important and we forget it too because the babies are so cute and they're so exciting and that's what we really want to see and everybody knows it, you know, but you have to also check in on this person as a person, not even, not even check in on her just as a mother, you know, but just as a person. And it's really hard to, I see a lot of people forget this and they want to do everything for their baby and I get it. I totally do. And they want to be the best mom ever and they, devote themselves to it so fully they forget about themselves and it almost always comes to a head <laughs> around eight or nine months I find postpartum mom's been up with the baby every time the baby's ever woken up mom's changed every diaper the whole nine months mom's never left the baby with anyone even to go to the grocery store that kind of stuff gets to a point where it no longer works it always gets to a point where it no longer works so yeah that's when mamas lose their minds around nine months and they're like what the how am I doing? And I see it happen a lot. I really do. And it happened to me for sure. But um, that's when you're like, okay, who am I? And what do I want? And I can shower and I can do things. It's like, yes, you, you can and you should. So although it's hard and if you leave the baby with the grandma to go on a date or whatever, you'll be thinking about the baby the whole entire time. Yes, that's also normal. And it's also still necessary and you still should do it. So even if you have your mom come over and watch the baby upstairs, so you can watch a movie with your husband downstairs, but you have to do something that's not with the baby. You've got to. Um, also then, sunshine is not on this list, but super important. Vitamin D is huge in postpartum depression. First thing to supplement with or to worry about is going outside, getting sun, and taking vitamin D. Um, what else is on here? Have I set realistic goals and been gentle on myself today? So... All of those are super important things. There's another resource that I'm gonna send you for the um, resource list that's called the snowball. Um, oh, my favorite new thing to think about and talk about, sorry. Now we're gonna run all the way till eight. Okay, I studied psychology. So one thing I've been thinking about lately and I'm totally gonna to do this, I'm gonna do it, is making a Maslow's hierarchy of needs for moms. So at the very, very bottom of this, this was a psychologist who figured at the bottom, we have the need for safety and food and water and sleep. Then above that, you can start to think about other things, next level, you just go to the next level. And the next level might be learning and relationships and connecting and it goes up from there, right? And at the very, very top is self-actualization. That's what he always talked about. But what I'd like to think is, you're a mom, you just had a baby and you're at the bottom 
because you're not getting enough sleep, probably. You're maybe not eating enough. You know, it's like the bit you go back to the very, very basic survival. If you're in survival mode, it's a real thing and a real place to be. And yes, you probably won't have a sex drive. If you're in survival mode, that's a, that's a reality and it happens. But you've got to think, what are my next level needs and how can I get these ones met so I can move up and get my next level met? Like having friendships and having connections and, and learning new things or having a hobby or having a sex drive. I didn't even put this on my list, but now I'm talking about it. Um, it's important to have realistic expectations, okay? And for everyone, for the partner, for the mom, for the other kids in the family. So my last one on my list was expectation, having realistic expectations and then communication and relationships. So if you have other kids, find a way to set aside some time where they either get fun trips with grandma to the zoo or field trips to the park or with maybe not you for the first few weeks. But after that, maybe, maybe you are the one and maybe grandma comes over and hangs out with the baby and you go off and get ice cream. If you don't have family nearby, there's obviously a postpartum doula nearby or someone else you can hire or dad even when he gets home from work to hang out with the baby so you can take the toddler to the park or whatever. So making time for each relationship that's going on in your family and, and for the husband or partner because, but it's going to look different. You know, you can do at home date nights. There's plenty of that. Google it. Pinterest, it's everywhere. Um, even if you're watching a movie downstairs after you put baby to bed, you know, but just making it a point to make time for it and then having realistic expectations for yourself, but also the partner having realistic expectations, but both of you. And if you haven't had the baby yet, talk about this. And even if you have, talk about this, like who is going to get up at 3 a.m.? If she's thinking he's going to do it and he's thinking she's going to do it, it's a recipe for disaster. If he's thinking since he goes to work nine to five, she's going to get up all night, every night on the Monday through Friday nights. It's important to know that ahead of time. If she's still thinking he's going to get up and do diapers at 4 a.m., you've got to know, you know. But this also goes back to like um, thinking your newborn's going to sleep through the night at five weeks or something like that. It's not realistic. So having a realistic idea of what this is going to look like, and it is going to throw you for a loop. It for sure will, always does. Um, and I feel like it's about a year where you get back on your feet and you get back to like, oh, who am I and what am I doing? And I'm not just a mom. That takes like a year. Um, a book for this is called And Baby Makes Three and it's by the Gottmans. So that's, um, they're the super gurus of marriage and relationships. And they have a book just about this, just about adjusting to having babies. Um, that's about it. And then my safe word for visitors comes in here. So my pineapple or whatever it's going to be when you're just like, Hey, I've had enough. I'm done. I need a minute. And that can go on. I honestly, I can see uses for this currently now with my youngest being four. If I was like, Hey husband, pineapple time, here's the kid. And I walk out the front door, he would know what I meant. And by all means, that's a useful tool for all of us all the time. So anyway, that is what I have there for my 10 bullet points of postpartum. That's about it. That was amazing, Candace. I so wish I had this hour talk. <laughs> I always feel that way. Yeah. And, and if you give your, even with the four-year-old, you say pineapple, then they don't have to feel badly that they're causing you the stress. So I think that that's a really clever tip. It's a I good wonder, one. I wonder if that would work with a teenager. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, we just have a minute um, left. Um, Jen or Peyton, do you girls have any um, specific questions or maybe Perry or Joanna, if you have any? I feel like you were so thorough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've done this a couple times. Not this format, but this is part of the childbirth class that I've yeah. been teaching for 10 years. So, um, Candice, thank you so much. That was really informative. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I have a quick question. So, and it might be too much to go over now. So just tell me if I need to just Google it. But um, you were talking about what's normal yeah. for a baby to sleep yeah. and like how often they should be sleeping versus feeding. Yeah. Um, and what does that look like? That's a really good question. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you a couple of resources and then I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, a book I really like for this is called Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child. 
and it talks about what's normal in the development of a baby at all the different ages. And so that's awesome. And one thing that's great about the book is if you have a one month old, there's a chapter for just that age. You don't have to read the whole entire book to get it. You can just read the one chapter, which is awesome. Um, and it's really normal that they wake up really often. And uh, you could probably expect a baby after the first couple of weeks to sleep a four hour stretch. But the problem is they're probably going to do it during the day. So for them to get it in the night and figure out that wake time is daytime and sleep time is nighttime takes some time, right? But having them sleep a four hour stretch is not, it's not unreasonable to try to push the baby and, and give them a binky or try to soothe them and not feed them for four hours straight at night. It's not unreasonable. But to go 8 p.m. to midnight and then I'm going to feed at midnight and now I expect them to go to 4 a.m., that's unreasonable. So one four hour stretch is pretty doable. Two four hour stretches takes a lot longer. That's months down the road. So, you know, knowing what's normal in that way and that it's normal that a baby squeaks and squirms and makes noises and opens their eyes and, and even cries a little bit with their eyes closed and they're still actually asleep. So that's one of the biggest things is every little noise they make does not need your attention when they're laying down and sleeping. But, but as especially a first time mom, we think it does. And even every time I get a new postpartum doula client and I'm at someone's house with a new baby, every squeak I hop up every time until I figure that baby out, you know, but every baby's different. So if you can put your hand on the baby, just put some weight on the baby or re-swaddle or give them a binky. If you're doing binkies, if you're not into it, then you don't have to, um, but they do like them a lot and there's no developmental reason not to. There's no scary thing that happens. If you give a baby a binky, there's nothing bad about it. Um, if they get addicted to it, some babies do. There's a way to get off that later. But um, anyway, if you can solve the squirks, the squirks, the squirms and the squeaks and the little cries and the little eye opening with a binky or putting a hand on them or a little rock, you can even put your hand on the little baby's body and rock your hand. You don't have to get the baby up to rock them like this, you know? Um, but just wiggling them a little bit or shushing them a little bit or whatever. So if you can solve that, then they're actually not awake. So it doesn't actually count as a wake up. And if they wake up and need to eat, they will be awake awake with their eyes open or be crying, like crying that isn't stopping after 20 seconds, you know? But that would be, I could go on, but that's pretty good. Um, so the taking care of babies is a good resource for this. Happy healthy sleep habits, happy child, really good one. There's a book called Sweet Sleep that I really like. Um, and another resource I forgot to mention is an online, you can Google it, it's called Hug Your Baby. And it's like a online um, courses that will teach you what's normal for development, like what's a hunger sign and what's a sleepy sign and what's, um, you know, just learning about your newborn and their behaviors and what's normal and what develops next, that kind of stuff. Um, and one more for that is Happiest Baby on the Block. Really, really good resource. You can just YouTube it or Google it or whatever. There are classes, there's a book, there's a video. Um, but knowing all that stuff too can help a lot. Great, thank you. You're welcome. You, are you ready, Jenna? Are you ready, Jen, to have to be postpartum? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't scare you. <laughs> No, this is all, it's good information to have. Um, I, I'm learning a lot. Good. Is this your first? Yes. Well, you're lucky to have Candace in this conversation. Like Sarah, I really wish that I'd had this beforehand. Um, and I think that one thing that really helped, we did use the doula and we, um, she came over to our house and we had a conversation um, when I was still pregnant about kind of the experience and it feeds into kind of your last point about expectations. And, and this is where um, I wanted to get your opinion, Candace, because I feel like so much of what you talked about was like spot on for what I experienced. And, you know, I think that one of the hardest parts for me were those expectations. Um, I had a really great pregnancy and I really enjoyed it. And then um, that part of the, this is part of the reason we started Hive is because a lot of people don't talk about other things that happen postpartum or how to deal with the difficult circumstances. Um, it's kind of, well, how are you and the baby? And you feel like you should be like, great, everything's fine. And like, it's, it's not, it's hard, you know? Um, it's also fantastic, right? right. Um, so my question for you comes with, I think that one of my, 
uh, most pertinent difficulties during that time was um, changing course. It was like, I was so tired and I knew we might like, Max might come in and be like, we, we need to change this. Like I'm noticing this pattern. Um, and I was like, so tired. I couldn't stop and kind of change directions or bring in another strategy. So um, do you see that a lot? And are there, are there practices where it's like, okay, no, we need to have, you know, somebody come over and watch the baby and we both sit down and talk about this. Um, or like, do you see that a lot? I mean, yeah, I think sleep deprivation is a real thing. <laughs> I think every mom will have that at some part. There is, you're not going to feel well rested for a long, long time. And you will be surprised how much sleep you can function on or how little sleep you can function on. But yeah, I think it's hard to make decisions. And I highly recommend you don't make any critical ones ever when you're sleep deprived. Don't ever sell your house, quit your job, get divorced any of those big things. When you're really, really sleep deprived, you'll want to do them. You will. You'll have like a moment where you're like, I can't handle this anymore. I don't want to. And it's sleep, you know? So that's in just life too. I always do this. My sister the other day was overwhelmed with her job and wanted to quit. And I was like, don't do it today. Today, you're overwhelmed. Don't do it today. If you can think about it for a couple more days, then make a decision. But yeah, plant a new strategy. And I feel like that comes back to that hierarchy of needs. You're in survival mode and you're not well rested. So you can't critically think and analyze and make new plans until you take care of that first one, you know? And that's any time mom is so overwhelmed or any of that, sleep is the first, very, very first thing, you know? Even if it was just one time ever in your postpartum that you had a postpartum doula so you could get one whole night of sleep, even if it was just one day, it would make a difference, you know? And it does. So go back to that, the first needs, you know, if you're in survival mode, you're not sleeping, you're not eating. There is no other needs. There's no other plan. There's no new strategy. There's no survival, anything. There's nothing past that until you get that met. So it's a, it's like a crisis recovery plan. We're going to get you sleep, whatever it takes to get you that sleep. We're going to do it. Even if it's just on the weekend, dad does bottles on Saturday night and you sleep every Saturday night. If you know that's coming, it's worth gold, you know? So like my last baby, I had my postpartum doula like Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 11 to three, I think is what we did. It was amazing. Even Tuesday and Thursday were easier because I knew the next day she was coming from 11 to three and I was gonna get a nap and a shower and a meal and she would play with my toddler so I didn't have to. Just that, you know? So yeah, I think it just goes back to survival. If you're in, that just shows that you're still in that mode, you know? it's hard to make decisions and it's hard to critically analyze and think of new ideas. And it's just, it's the same now, you know, if I have worked a graveyard shift, this is why postpartum doulas don't work five nights a week. We don't, none of us do, we can't do it. So if I've worked a graveyard shift the next day, I have really low expectations for myself and it's awesome because I have to. So I don't expect everything to get done. I don't make a lot of plans. I don't run a lot of errands. I usually make no plans at all. And there, that's why, because I'm, I'm going back to the postpartum state because I know I'm getting a postpartum mom out of that state, but it takes recovery for me as a doula. So it's kind of crazy because I work with a team of doulas because if someone wants five nights a week of sleep, we can't, none of us are willing to do it. We won't. So I'll do two nights a week at the most, but it's so much, it's so much to ask of anyone, but I love doing it because I'm helping someone and I know that. But yeah, low expectations, <laughs> just <laughs> lower the expectations. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your I love, question. I love, I love how, how real you are. You're always- Sorry, you're that's that. how it is. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have any other questions before we say bon, bon nuit? <laughs> Peyton? I just had one kind of follow-up question to exactly what you said. So my baby is just a little over three months and I- honestly feel like I'm still in the survival mode 95% of the time and I almost feel too that I should be not in postpartum almost because my baby's you know past three months and so I'm just wondering um in your opinion you know how long does the postpartum you know duration is it nine months are these feelings normal mm -hmm. 
Should I not be in the survival mode? Should I be further up on the, on the needs list? You know, I really don't think so. I think it's really, really normal to be like, hey, all I can do is the bare minimum. I have a three-month-old baby. That's really normal. Um, and it's really hard. And, and in, in Park City, where we are at, and here's who we're talking to, most women are still working or they go back after their maternity leave, you know, and it's hard to, to expect that much of yourself. And I think one of the real sad things that we do to ourselves, and I do it to myself as much as you're doing it to yourself, but you're saying, I should be out of this. I should be doing this. I should be, I should have it more together. I should have brushed my kid's hair today. I should be out the door. I should have wiped their nose. We all should look like we have it together when we go out in public. You're just all day. And you're just, I should, I should, I should, and I should, I should, I should. And the place I'm at is obviously wrong because I should be doing something different. That's the saddest thing. And not just for you, for everyone and me as a mom. Like, um, it's okay to only be able to do the bare minimum, you know? And it's a really good place to start. And I really feel like that takes, like I was saying before, it takes almost a year before you're like, okay, whew, I'm coming out of the fog a little bit. Or one thing I like to liken it to is like getting knocked down by a wave. If you've ever done that in the ocean and you can't even tell what's up and what's down and you can't even get a breath and you're just in the turmoil. And then there will be a point where you come out of it and you'll come out of it. But it really does take a freaking long time and it's okay. And I think it's normal. If you're feeling like yourself, you're feeling like a very tired version of yourself, a very busy version of yourself, but you're still yourself. That's okay. If you're not like that, you know, and you're like, hey, I don't even like being a mom. This actually sucks. That's different. And, and there are moments that suck. And there are moments that you don't like being a mom, for sure. But if you're in that all day, if you're like, screw this, okay, for a get real moment, when I had my very first baby, I had serious postpartum depression, but didn't know and didn't know what it was. Never did get help for it, never told anybody because I didn't know. And when he was like five days old, maybe six, seven days old, I wanted to give him away. I loved him and I was like, you're the cutest little baby in the whole wide world, but I don't think I want to be a mom. Like, I was just like, I don't know if I like this at all. Like, this isn't cool. I know there's other people out there who want babies. I could probably give him to one of them and I can go back to sleep because I was really struggling. But I didn't know that that wasn't normal, you know? But yeah, there's moments of motherhood that are certainly not fun. <laughs> there's moments of postpartum that are certainly not fun. And that's normal for sure. But I think it's normal to be survival mode is as far as you get like eating and sleeping and getting to work on time and not losing it that's normal <laughs> that's fine you know and just be gentle on yourself like having realistic expectations is also forgiving yourself for not being farther along you know so i think you for it. yeah i I wanted to just say one quick thing, Peyton, about that is I feel like when Candace uh, did mention that four months is kind of when your baby starts to get into the like sleep rhythm of taking consistent naps and starting to get a little bit more into a schedule mm -hmm. that all of a sudden once your baby does t start to take those consistent naps and does have more of a schedule of sleep your whole mindset changes. Like you actually have time during the day that you can do things or take a nap or, and I think that like you're on the, you know, brink of getting to that point of your baby is about to start to have a rhythm, start to have a schedule. And, um, but you're, I mean, three months is still a little bitty baby. Like it's still just so new. Um, and, I would not be hard on yourself at all if you feel like you are in a fog or just, you know, in survival mode, because that's what it is. I mean, you're getting there. <laughs> that's a really good point. And I think maybe one thing to look for is there will be more small moments of coming out of the fog. And then there will just be more of those. And it'll get more and more and more common. And then eventually there won't be any fog. But for right now, there's a lot of fog. But if there's you think about a three month old baby, if you think about the fourth trimester, you're not even out of the fourth trimester with a three month old baby. You're not even to 13, 14 weeks of the baby being out of your body. It's really crazy, you know, but that's a huge milestone too. That, yeah, like you said, you're almost there, you know, to where it's, it'll start to get easier. 
And then new things you didn't expect will be hard. You know, people are always like, oh, the newborn stage is so hard. It's like, no, wait, have a toddler. They're hard too, but they sleep better, you know? So it's like the things that are hard now will get easy and you'll get new challenges for sure. And all the way through parenting, I mean, with teenagers too. It's just like new things get hard and the hard things got easier and it's just phases and you'll get, you know, but it'll start to get easier. And the things that are so hard now, six months from now, won't be so hard. And you'll look back and be like, wow, that wasn't hard. But teething is hard, you know? So it's like, you'll just have a new, a new challenge. I don't know, but you'll get there. That's helpful. Thank you all. Yeah. And I'm so happy you're here, Peyton. I mean, to have work and showing up. I just feel, I'm glad you're a part of the hive. I feel like I'm late the game, never too late. You're not. There's no such thing. And I always think of the fourth trimester that they, they would be in our bodies if there was room, but there's no room, so they come out, you know? But I think that I always think of that first three months is like, you know, it's just the outside experience of, you know. And they, so prefer, to, they prefer to be on our bodies. They yeah, that's what I'm like thinking. Bodies. For three months at least. I mean forever, but for three months, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Candace. I, I really think this is going to be so valuable. I mean, it is to all of us here seeing it live and um and to be able to share with with our people because th these are the people that need to hear it. And you're just so talented and passionate and um, I really appreciate you putting those resources together with your contact information because um, I know maybe someone's interested in your services or your birthing classes or your, um, you know, advice, your kind, kind advice. So thank you so much. And I wish all you ladies a really, really wonderful evening. Yes. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Jenny. I'm glad you're here. Or Jen. <laughs>